Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Santoraco, a professor of classics here at New York University and the director of our Center for Ancient Studies. As those of you know who have participated in our events over the years, the center was founded 25 years ago within the Faculty of Arts and Science to promote interdisciplinary and cross-cultural study of the past. We do this by encouraging faculty and students in a variety of arts and science disciplines and programs, as well as in other schools and institutes of the university to collaborate with one another through curriculum, research projects, occasional publications, and international study grants for undergraduates and graduate students. We also reach out to the larger scholarly community and also the general public. Thus, the Aquila Theater is company in residence at our center. In addition, we have sponsored through the Faculty Resource Network summer and winter seminars for faculty from colleges and universities across the country who come here to study aspects of the ancient world. Finally, we reach an even larger public through our annual conferences, many of which explore areas where ancient and modern experiences intersect and where the perspectives offered by the past can help us analyze and understand contemporary issues and challenges. We're certainly at a challenging moment right now. When the pandemic suddenly necessitated a pivot last spring to online work, the programming of our center was interrupted. We are resuming it now, but in a virtual format. Thus, we are inaugurating this evening a series of webinars that the seminar will be hosting throughout this year. Organized around the general rubric, Topics for Challenging Times, Ancient Perspectives on Modern Issues. The three webinars we've planned for this semester will explore three timely topics. The first is the one that we will focus on today, Elections, Ancient and Modern. The next webinar, which will take place on Thursday, October 29th, will focus on a very different topic, monuments and memory. At a time when our history is contested and monuments commemorating it are being toppled or defaced, it seems worthwhile to consider the role that ancient monuments played in their societies in memorializing, but also revising and sometimes effacing history. Finally, on Thursday, December 3rd, we will have a panel discussion of what we're calling for want of a better phrase, applied ancient studies. That is how the field is reaching out to non-traditional or underserved communities, such as prisoners, indigenous pop populations, veterans and refugees. Next semester, we will be hosting a symposium on pandemics ancient and modern that will focus on the bioarchaeology of pandemics, on their historical and sociological implications, and also the role of plague in the artistic imagination from Homer onwards. We will also inaugurate a webinar series on emerging scholars, where we will showcase research that is being conducted by current graduate students who seek to address new topics or use new methodologies. And we look forward to including in this series scholars from groups that have been or still are marginalized or underrepresented in the field of ancient studies and in the academy as a whole. If you're interested in attending any of these events, please check out the center's website. The website also contains an up-to-date calendar of all lectures, exhibitions, or conferences at NYU that are related to the ancient world. But now it's time to focus on our topic, elections. Just two weeks before a national election that many believe will be the most consequential of our lives, it will be interesting to explore this aspect of people power in antiquity. In keeping with the familiar trope that America is Rome, it's often noted that many of the current concerns expressed about our elections, ranging from the possibility of voter suppression and fraud to the threat of intimidation or even violence, were not 
unfamiliar to the ancient Romans. Even the conduct of political campaigns looks strikingly similar to what took place at Rome, at least as it's described in an electioneering handbook purportedly written by the brother of the great orator Cicero. That manual included such sage advice as to call in favors, cater to special interest groups, promise everything to everyone, and seek out publicity. Perhaps the only advice that doesn't any longer ring quite true is the importance the author places on eloquence. The question before us now is whether and to what extent the ancient experience can throw any light on our own contemporary situation. To help us figure this out, we are so fortunate to have with us today two remarkable scholars whose work bears directly on this question. Joy Connolly is president of the American Council of Learned Societies. Before that, she served as interim president of the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where she had also been provost and distinguished professor of classics. Previously, she was professor of classics and dean for the humanities at NYU, and we are delighted to welcome her back for this event. Educated at Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania, Professor Connolly has focused her scholarly research on Roman republicanism, political rhetoric and civic discourse, the formation of political judgment and classical reception. In addition to having published over 70 articles and reviews, she is the author of two major books, both published by Princeton, The State of Speech, Rhetoric and Political Thought in Ancient Rome, and The Life of Roman Republicanism. Her current book project is a study of the value of Roman writing on selected problems in modern political thought, with a special focus on the work of Hannah Arendt. In addition to her work on classics and on politics, she has also spoken and published on higher education and on the future of the humanities. And her articles have appeared in such venues as the New York Times Book Review, the Times Literary Supplement, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Nation. Melissa Michelson, is Dean of Arts and Science at Menlo College, where she is also Professor of Political Science, a nationally recognized expert on voter mobilization, Latino politics, and LGBTQ rights. She is the award-winning author or co-author of six books, including Mobilizing Inclusion, Transforming the Electorate, through Get Out the Vote campaigns, and most recently, just this year, a book, Transforming Prejudice, Identity, Fear, and Transgender Rights. Educated at Columbia and Yale, she has, from the outset of her career, based her work solidly in activist scholarship. Focusing on members of marginalized groups, she uses her research to motivate and promote greater equality and justice. Professor Michelson is a founding executive committee member of Women Also Know Stuff and past president of both the Latino Caucus and the LGBTQ Caucus of the American Political Science Association. She is a past visiting faculty fellow at Stanford University's Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity and currently co-editor of the journal Politics groups, and identities. In addition to her many publications and professional activities, she also reaches a larger audience through the media, in TED Talks, on television, and as well as in national publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. The format of this afternoon's event will be as follows. Uh, each speaker, beginning with Professor Connolly, will offer some introductory thoughts and remarks on the subject. And then the two of them will engage in a dialogue with one another. They will then take questions from all of us, the participants, the attendees in this webinar. And you can submit 
questions using the Q&A function that appears on the bottom of your webinar screens. So now, without any further delay, I'd like to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Joy Connolly. Thank you so much, Matthew. And uh, I will just apologize for my lighting here and make a little adjustment, if I may. The, uh, the, these evening events are, uh, are catching my, uh, my, my windows a little bit by surprise. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm really delighted to, to be participating in an event run by the NYU Center for Ancient Studies uh, Matthew, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for organizing this. And thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made it happen. And welcome everyone in the audience. It's a pleasure to be back at, uh, at NYU for this event. And, and timely too, when Matthew first got in touch with me and, and uh, er, earlier this year in the summer and said uh, those, those both welcome and dreaded words, are you able, are you free to, to, uh, to discuss uh, the, the upcoming election and, and consider it in light of the ancient Roman experience, uh, along with you know, balancing all the work all of us has to ha have to do these days, I, I, my mind instantly leapt to how useful this would be for me and how much I look forward to it as a way to channel some of my uncertainty and worry. I think whatever one's politics, whatever one's uh, hopes or beliefs about this upcoming election, there's no question, as Matthew said, it is um, a momentous moment in, in our, our current history. Uh, and, and this event, I'm hoping, will be for me as for all of you and for my colleague, uh, Melissa, from uh, out in California, uh, from Menlo, Menlo College. I, I hope we manage to, to channel our, our thinking, our, our emotional energy, our psychological energy, into intellectual energy, and gain some insights um, into, into the significance of electoral politics for where we are today and, it's, and how history, uh, how the historical experience of the late first century Roman Republic in particular, that's where I'm coming from, can illuminate uh, the contemporary experience. This is very much, uh, as Melissa and I have, have envisioned it, uh, an experiment in putting together compare and contrast and see what happens. Uh, we're very um, we're, we're interested to see where, where we bounce off of each other, where the conversation will go, and look forward to your questions. So let me say just a couple of things by way of, uh, of more substantive introduction. And, and, and take you back a couple of thousand years um, into first century Rome. Uh, and those of you who know anything about Roman history know that it's a long, a long history. The Republic um, has several centuries of, of voting practice and electoral politics under its belt that we could talk about. But I'm focusing on what used to be called, and this is a, I mean, all these top, all these labels are, are up for debate, but it used to be called roughly the last century of the Roman Republic, um, the dating of, of this conventionally being uh, uh, in the in the last couple of decades of the before the turn of the millennium, so to speak, in hindsight, when uh, the person we now think of as the Emperor Augustus, um, Octavian, the grand nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar, as we're as classicists or ancient historians are accustomed to say, he consolidated autocratic power. That's a that's a um, typical label for what happened, uh, whether you say it happened in 31 or 27 or sometime later um, in the first century. So I'm I'm talking about the the, I mean, the there are lots of issues with what I just said and and that that identification of those that decade as a as the linchpin or the end of anything. But for now, let me just say I'm talking I'm using it as a as a peg uh, to to make it clear that I'm talking about the century before that. So electoral politics. I mean, just a very very brief couple facts to to peg on uh, to peg our discussion onto. Uh, electoral politics in the Roman Republic in its last century. Uh, worked in a number of different ways, but imagine uh, live voting in order to vote. Um, one had to be a citizen in order to be a citizen. One had to be a free uh, man. One had to have Roman citizenship uh, and to be present in Rome to cast one's vote. So there, was, there were no mail-in mail ballots. There were no um, remote ballots. One had to be present in the city. There was a religious festival uh, accompanying the uh, really civic religious festival ac accompanying the voting. And I'm going to talk just about the what was called the Centuriate Assembly, which was the assembly uh, of, uh, of citizens that voted in the top 
um, officials, the top magistrates in the Roman Republic, the consuls, the praetors, and the censors. These were all year-long posts. These, the men running for office, and we're really going to talk about electoral candidacy, so I'll, I, that's why I'm focusing on them. These men uh, came without fail from wealthy families. They had to meet a wealth requirement, a property requirement to run for office. Uh, Roman, Roman politics was dominated by a really astonishingly small number of noble families, uh, joined occasionally by men who called themselves novi homines or new men. Uh, who also came from wealthy families themselves, but not from the core of the Roman aristocracy. But we're talking here really about a very small number of noble families vying for the votes of a variety of, of citizens, but in a voting system that was weighted explicitly and publicly according to property. Um, so the wealthy got to vote first, the poor voted last. There are lots of questions about whether the poor would have even had their votes counted, uh, whether their and, and their votes certainly, given the mathematics of voting, often literally arithmetically did not count. So if it, as the votes were counted, rich down to poor, as soon as a majority was reached, uh, the, the vote was over and the candidate, the successful candidates for consul, praetor, and censor were chosen. So that's the, the, the radical, <laughs> quite different situation from what we have have today in, in many respects. Some of you may be thinking there are some points of contact there too, and that's what we're going to talk about. So I'll just say in closing before handing it over to Melissa, here we are in this radically different world of, of uh, an assembly coming together, uh, voting rich to poor, having to be there in person on a single day. Um, why even compare and contrast this kind of situation? Well, um, it's my belief that, that first of it's really two things. The, it's my belief that the looking at the texts such as we have them, the evidence surrounding Roman elections, the way people talked about running for office and gaining popular favor, um, still, despite the formal differences, ha has a, a deep lessons for us as we think about the role of persuasion, the role of policy, of identity, of sense of a sense of community. Uh, citizen sense of how power flows in a society and these texts illuminate aspects of human political psychology that I think are, are worth studying. Second, uh, and, and just briefly, there's no question at all that the founders of the United States looked to the Roman Republic and looked to its voting structures uh, and the very name, uh, res publica, public thing, uh, as, a, as a model when they designed this country. And uh, for, for all that that signifies, and there's a lot to think about there, um, there's good reason, I think, to do this exercise and compare and contrast. So, um, Melissa, let me hand it over to you to hear about your perspective on electoral politics, very, very different one than mine, I know. Thanks, Joy. And uh, thank you also to NYU and Matthew and everyone for inviting us. Uh, Joy said it all very nicely, so I don't want to repeat what she said, but um, this really is a delightful idea for an event, and the more that I talked to Joy about it, the more I thought that it was brilliant. And um, there really is a lot that is constant from the first century of um, Ro the Roman Empire to, to modern politics. So uh, my perspective is very different. I, I study ongoing elections. I'm very in, enmeshed right now in various efforts to look at what's happening in 2020 and looking at how people are deciding not just whether or not to vote, but then who to vote for. And it is a lot about identity and it is a lot about uh, the messages that they're hearing from uh, what you could really call a, a small group of wealthy elite um, members of uh, the U.S. Congress are are wealthy. Uh, people who who reach the pinnacle of U.S. politics are very wealthy, and uh, the degree to which the poor actually have a voice in politics. Um, yeah, again, as Joy was talking, I was thinking about the difference there. So, just to give some background in terms of how I approach this, my scholarship in electoral politics is mostly about voter turnout and the gap that we persistently see between folks who vote and folks who, despite being eligible to vote, choose not to participate. And as is, uh, should not be surprising to hear that if you don't vote, you tend to not have political power. And so 
Um, if older people and wealthier people are more likely to vote, public policies tend to favor older people and wealthier people. And if uh, less economically advantaged people, communities of color, uh, unhoused people don't vote, then their priorities are less likely to be reflected in public policy. And so as we continue to try to achieve the lofty goals of the founding fathers of um, you know, equal opportunity and the American dream and uh, everybody being treated equally, it is necessary then for all sorts of people to be heard at the polls. And so we need these groups that tend to have low rates of participation, people of color, poor people, et cetera, to increase their rates of voter turnout. So my work for the past few decades has been focused on how do we get more of those people in those underrepresented communities to vote? With the idea being that once we can show policymakers that they are voting, that then policymakers will be more likely to be attentive to their priorities. Can we increase Black voter turnout? Can we increase Latinx voter turnout? Can we increase Asian American voter turnout? And can we increase youth turnout? Those are the four communities that I've based my work in. And a lot of the work in terms of voter mobilization in those communities is similar in terms of it's the same strategies, the same ideas that work to get them out to vote. And some of them are not. Uh, and youth in particular are very different, right? Because uh, as my students told me, you know, we're looking at a pretty bleak future. And so, you know, maybe we have kind of a darker outlook on things than older generations. Um, Black Americans tend to see voting as something that is a right that they fought for as a community. And so voting can be a sign of respect for folks who fought and protested and died for the right to vote. Um, so there's different perspectives on voting and, and what it means. And thus there's different things that work in terms of messaging to those communities and, and helping them have a voice. Um, but it does all come down to them having a voice and making sure that their priorities are heard at the polls. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't wanna jump into the question. I was like jumping at the bit to get at the specific questions, but I think um, maybe I should stop there because I actually really want to get to the questions that we have prepared and also to, to make this more of the conversation. So I'm, I'm gonna pause right there. Thanks, Melissa. And, uh, and I, I too am really eager to get into the questions. I, I confess, I thought I wanted to give people a little sense of what the different system was like because we're in, 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 in the Roman Republic, because we're living in the one you work on, you have that yeah, huge People are advantage. probably more familiar <laughs> with this one because they live in it, so. Right, right. Um, well, I, but, but yeah, let's dive into the, the first topic that you and I talked about a bit um, that, that has to do with you know, the debate happening tomorrow uh, with the media that's surrounding us now that you know, how, uh, how candidates connect with voters and then and now and why. And I, I'll kick it off just by saying, you know, Matthew mentioned the, the, the very short pamphlet by supposedly by the brother of Cicero, great statesman, political thinker, um, called the Commentarium uh, uh, Petitionis, the, the pamphlet on on electioneering, and it it it's really eerily. It, it sounds like it could be written yesterday because it has passages saying you've got to know who your friends are, and you've got to have some rich friends and influential friends, and then you've got to find the people who are influential in their own communities, make good friends of them, um, and then. But you've also got to have crowd appeal. So I'm thinking really of the second um of the of, of the crowd appeal in terms of connecting with voters there's a, a famous anecdote of um a man named scipio one of the scipion the scipiones uh, the scipio family was one of the extremely wealthy noble families i mentioned earlier who dominated roman politics for generations and this particular denizen of the scipio family um, was running for office and did as roman politicians had to do mingled in the forum and mingled in the streets and met voters and did the handshaking and and baby kissing that that still goes on and 
you know, extremely wealthy, extreme, you know, noble, well-born. And he met a man from the countryside and shook his hand. And the man's hand was so calloused from uh, hard work on the farm that this Scipio said, laughed and said, oh, what have you been doing? It's, it feels like you've been walking on your hands all the way to Rome. And the crowd got very angry and he lost the election because the uh, his, his disdain and contempt for manual labor, um, at least this is how it was read by the crowd that saw it. And, um, and so it, what seemed to have been a sure election in this anecdote was lost. Uh, so there's a so Romans walked Roman candidates walked a fine line between um, between living their reality of wealth and power and influence and they were born to it and public service was the career for for these for the boys and these families and yet uh, they had to be wary of how they inhabited that so so given that how when you I mean as you said so many American politicians are come, are come from wealth or, or gain wealth in the course of their careers. How do you see them charting that course of celebrity and wealth on the one hand and, a, and some kind of egalitarian populism on the other? Well, I think we can see very different methods of approaching that, right? So for example, with Trump, we've all seen pictures of his gilded home in Trump Tower and uh, maybe Melania Trump draped in jewels, right? He is definitely trying to put out this image of himself as very wealthy, right? And he talks about his wealth and how he's a successful businessman. And so his way of connecting with quote unquote, normal Americans, average Americans is to say, you know, I made it <clears throat> and so can you, right? That's selling the American dream, selling the idea that if you work hard and you're smart, you can have this gilded life. You can have this, this these riches. And, and many voters definitely respond to that, right? There's still, even though the evidence for social mobility is questionable, um, you know, most people don't really change their financial situation over their lifetime, but there's still this idea that if you work hard enough, if you're smart enough, you can get rich, right? And so he's selling that. He's selling, I'm a success and you can be a success too. We see the opposite. With Biden, right? He's Joe from Scranton. He's Amtrak Joe. He's talking to regular people. He's right. And so uh, for Joe, he's not emphasizing his wealth. He is emphasizing his connection to ordinary people and his campaign is right. And we've always seen this. Um, there have been books written about how uh, what Fenno called the home style, where uh, in Congress, members of Congress would wear suits and be, you know, be driven around in a chauffeured car. But then when they went back home to their district, they'd put on a flannel shirt and drive around in an old truck. So they still had to make that connection with voters of I, you know, I'm one of you, I haven't lost touch. But then when they were in Washington, they were being this professional politician and many politicians have lost their seats because voters started to see them as having lost touch that they've become you know, beltway insiders, that they spend too much time in the state capital and they don't understand the problems of everyday people. So that's the more common approach. Um, Trump's doing a very different approach, which is totally working as well. So they're both viable. Do you, in your work with, especially getting, as, as you said, um, working on getting the votes out from communities that haven't voted in, in numbers in the past as they could and, and you know, we would all ideally like to see, uh, is there, how do you see people weighing the, the performance of this, this negotiation versus the policies that, that they take, yeah. that, that these individual politicians are taking? I think we in, all have to their, remember, yeah. yeah, I think we just all have to remember that most people aren't really paying that much attention, right? <laughs> um, there, there was a lovely, um, op-ed um, by Yana Krupnikov in the New York Times just the other day about this. There's um, there's the, those of us who are on Twitter and, and are paying attention to politics and reading you know, multiple newspapers every day. And then there's most of America, which is just barely paying attention. Um, so policy is really not, <laughs> it's really not about policy. Yes, there are some voters for whom the second amendment or reproductive rights are their one issue. And they all they need to know is, how do the candidates stand on one, that one issue? 
I'm good to go. These days, of course, that mostly maps onto partisanship. And for everyone, partisanship is the number one determinant of the vote. And so it's not so much about the specific policies that a candidate is putting forward. It's more about, is this candidate of my shared or my preferred political party? And mm -hmm. that's how you decide who to vote for most of the time. And you can try to make inroads into uh, these communities. So for example, often we see folks who are trying to get the Latinx vote. They're gonna talk about immigration issues because they think, oh, that's a Latinx issue. But Latinx issues also care very much about the environment and jobs and education and healthcare and all the other stuff. Um, so it's so there. So some of them can be, you know, single issue voters. Um, but really, it tends to be uh, more about either the party or um, somebody that they feel a connection with. If we're talking about, say a primary election or a nonpartisan election. We have those a lot out here in California. Not so much for y'all in New York, but um, I don't know how much you want me to get into that. But like it really, for most people, it's not about policies. And that, well, that that's, you know, another, I think, bearing fruit, you know, this idea of thinking about compare and contrast and the value of looking at the ancient experience, because there's, uh, there, I mean, one Roman historian, Bob Morstein Marx out at uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, not too far away from you, has said that essentially, you know, there, there were no issue politics. Um, there were, no, you know, that, that uh, when he, when he surveys Roman Republican politics, and he looks at all the speeches that we have, um, the orations that were preserved uh, from from the the last couple of centuries of the republic, you know, not a lot, but there's some there. There's a, there's enough to work with, and his conclusion is that it, it is essentially uh, a matter of uh, the the candidate's reputation. Certainly, Rome Rome was a you know basically a military machine as a society. So, a reputation in the in the in the field, a good military career was a was a very powerful plus uh, for any candidate. Um, a success in the law court, success as a speaker. Um, also, uh, also popular. But when it came down to uh, policy positions, um, you know, more, more or less expansionist policies in whatever period uh, part of the empire was was seeing um, was seeing uh, uh, you know rebellion or or uh, seemed to be a right place for the empire to expand. Um, questions about extending. Um, extending authority over time to give generals, for example, the the time they needed to put, you know, to to conquer certain areas or um, or fight certain wars, um, religious issues. I mean, th these they were out there, but they're not the stuff of political discussion. And everyone pretty much hewed to the line of. Um, senatorial dignitas, which dig dignitas is not quite dignity, but it's a kind of mix of honor, status, reputation, and popular libertas, popular liberty or freedom. And pretty much every politician had this, had some version of, of, um, of this combination. And, and that's what he stood for. The question is how much there really was behind that. Right. I mean, there's definitely throughout the centuries, the, the theme of politicians say what they think you want to hear when it's time for the election, but when it comes down to, you know, what policies are they actually going to pursue or executive orders in modern times? Um, I don't know what they'd be called. Um, might not always be what they said they would do, right? Um, which sometimes the public gets really upset about, right? I think uh, some of us might remember George, George Herbert Walker Bush promising no new taxes, read my lips, no new taxes, and then after the election, he agreed to raise taxes in order to help the budget and people remembered and punished him for that. Um, so sometimes when you don't follow through on your campaign promises, you suffer. Um, but today, I think what most people assume really is that politicians are just saying what we want to hear. You can't trust them. They're all liars. Um, there's just really just such a widespread cynicism at this point that uh, I don't I don't know to what degree anybody's really being held accountable anymore for campaign promises. Mm. 
I wonder if um, we can go to some questions. My colleague at ACLS, James Schulman, is going to uh, pick up some. And uh, and I, too, if you'll forgive me and, and the informality of Zoom, I'm going to try to remedy my lighting situation. So um, let me fix that while I invite James to weigh in. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank okay. you. So one question is, uh, one way that classicists have made use of Roman history is try to mark the point in which the Republic went astray and thus essentially sealed the fate of tyranny. I wonder what points in Roman history stand out for the present. Obviously, the Senate's failure to recognize the plight of the poor. What about the Senate's repression of the Bacchanalia? Was this a quasi-totalitarian merger of church and state, as it were? Oh, great question. And that, that will open us up, I think, maybe to talk a little bit more about celebrity and individual uh, and, and individual appeal. Uh, I think that there's one of the reasons I, I was drawn in the early on in my career to think through Roman politics was, as I as I said very briefly at the beginning, precisely the the what it confronts us with, the what might be an eternal human problem, but certainly is a um, a long lasting or long enduring question of how individual people gain the trust and continued uh, and the continued vote over time um, or in support over time uh, when they're living in the public eye. And, and Roman politics has always really since the very beginning of the history that we know about, uh, I mean, originally Rome was a monarchy and there was, it was a, a violent, According to a myth, a kind of mix of myth and legend and, and historical uh, and historical events, uh, it, it's a it's a questionable story. But uh, but it was overthrown by a violent uh, aristocratic rebellion and and reestablished, reconstituted as a republic, but always with an emphasis on strong individual leaders who whose greatest heroism in in Roman kind of cultural myth was the subsuming of self for the good of the collective. So um, Brutus, one of the founders of the Roman Republic in, in, in the ancient legendary story, famously um, is not only responsible for killing the king and ending the monarchy, but his own son ends up getting seduced by the appeal of monarchical power and Brutus oversees the execution of his own son in order to stamp out any kind of you know, relapse into, in, in, into monarchical power. So that kind of heroic not just denial of self, but denial of one's own family and one's own succession is exactly the story that George Washington, you know, who also famously didn't have kids, and very important for him uh, in, in the late 18th century. He was compared to Brutus. Uh, luckily, he was never put in that kind of situation. But, um, but, but the point is that the, um, in relation to the question, that the seeds of uh, profound and, and dynamic appeal of a single individual man standing up for the good of the state was, is, is there from the earliest texts we know of. And what we start to see in the course of the late second century BCE and into the first century BCE are increasing numbers of Roman politicians who, make, who really push the envelope on that and break down norms, uh, longstanding norms like the year long uh, year year long limit uh, twelve months in office. Um, they break down no other norms of uh, political appointments and 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 other and other procedures, and but but they do so with popular approval and and with a popular mandate. And this is uh, this was the conundrum of the people who finally assassinated Julius Caesar. Uh, out of out, you know, these were a bunch of nobles, aristocrats, rivals, um, outraged by his own successful seizure long term of, of power, and uh, and you know their 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 assassination was successful, but the civil war they fought next was not, uh, and the one thing they definitely didn't reckon on was popular power. So it's a complicated story in this, and and I would kind of distill. I don't want to sound too much like I'm trying to pull a moral sermon out of this, but um, but certainly. Uh, this is something the founding generation in this country recognized that in Roman history itself, there's there's the story um, always just running beneath the surface of the appeal of the single powerful man who can overturn the system because of his, if, if he's successful in saying to enough people, I stand for you, all these other rich guys are out to get you, but I'm, I am you. Yeah. 
I mean, I think we definitely see that populism in modern politics, but I think one of the important features of the American system is because the founding fathers realized that actually people are selfish and do not sacrifice their own good for the common good that we have, the separation of powers, we have checks and balances. And so you can have a, a demagogic leader who is spouting populism and is saying, no, I'm, you know, I'm really doing this for you and is, and is then aggregating power. But if the institutions hold, then they are checked by the other branches, right? And we have this ongoing now. We have um, challenges being brought by Congress, not just impeachment, but just fights over, you know, legislation and what can and can't happen in the Trump administration. We have challenges, um, legal challenges. The state of California has sued the Trump administration over a hundred times. Um, so we also have the Federalist checks on the president's power. Um, so the, the idea that you could trust one person to be virtuous and to be this benevolent statesman leader uh, is one I think that the founders had pretty much rejected by 1787. But what we see over time is that Americans kind of forgot those lessons and allowed power to aggregate in the White House. And we have seen an amazing increase in how much power presidents have in recent decades. Um, on both sides, right? Every president, especially the ones we call good or great presidents have, have successfully increased the power of the president to the point now where President Trump can do quite a lot of things unilaterally and uh, unchecked. Um, but then at the same time, uh, we still have institutions holding. And so we still, you know, are gonna have an election. We're still, we still have other branches of government and the states uh, checking his power. So while he is the most powerful a president has ever been, there's still those checks in place to make sure that his, um, that he doesn't get completely out of control. So hold steady so far. Uh, we'll see what happens after this election. I mean, I think that's why we've had so many discussions about, sorry, I just need to like get this little mini rant out. Um, when I talk to my students, what I tell them about George Washington is is to me the most important thing he did is walk away in 1796 and say nope eight years was enough thank you not interested in being president for life and walking away and having that peaceful transition of power to john adams and that was him showing how this is supposed to work and we've always had presidents stepping away and that's where most democracies fail right is is that the person in power decides well, no, this is nice. I would think I will stay here being the ruler of this country. I love it. Um, and so the concerns that we're hearing now about whether there will be violence after the election or if the results are delayed or if the results aren't what everyone wants them to be, those are legitimate concerns because in many other countries throughout world history, that has been where democracy has failed. And that's where we'll see if the institutions are holding. If I can jump in, just jump, uh, jumping off what you just said about, um, about the failures of democracy, or at least the limits or the frustrations that we feel in it. Um, I'm thinking uh, again of, by the, the contrast of the Roman experience where we, we really don't have any evidence that, um, that, well, not only that the interests of the poor or less you know, less powerful were heard. There's really, I mean, we're living in a world in, in the first century, in first century Rome, where the purpose of the state is not to maximize, ma maximize goods for its citizens. You know, I mean, the pur pur purpose of the state is imperialistic. It's to extend the dominion, the, uh, the dominion of the empire. Um, it's to uphold the honor and and dignitas, the dignity of um, of the senate, of of, I mean, of the of the aristocratic order, um, and 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 to uphold popular liberty in that <laughs> conundrum that I mentioned before, but but not to advance the interests of the collective. I mean, that that isn't an, a notion that, um, at least in terms of material interests, I mean that's that that's not a core notion in that I take away from Roman political thought. One can you can tease out certain ways in which concern for material goods and recognition of individual citizens as such and as valuable in their own right 
that that this that those ideas are and notions are are present in a number of Roman texts, but I don't think it's fair to say that represents Roman political ideology. So so coming from that sense of contrast and thinking, you know, from your knowledge of the landscape of American politics, what are you seeing as the biggest blockages when it comes to the expression of popular interests and especially material goods from the sectors of the electorate you know best? So uh, there's a lot of, hmm, there are multiple directions I can take this. I think one of the things we're seeing is that uh, the people who do have power and wealth would like to keep it. Um, so one of the other trends that probably many folks are familiar with is increasing income inequality in this country where you know, the federal minimum wage has stagnated at 725. Um, and meanwhile, some individuals, some sectors, the 1% are getting wealthier and wealthier and, and wealth is aggregating. It's nice to be at the top, right? People don't want to give that up. Um, they don't want to have a higher tax rate. They don't want um, socialism, scary S word, uh, because it thinks maybe they lose what they have. And part of the American dream is also this idea, as I mentioned earlier, that you might become a billionaire, right? That anybody in theory has this ability to become a billionaire. And to some extent, that limits your desire to redistribute wealth or um, to provide for the poor because you think, well, if I become rich, I don't want it taken away by the government, right? And we also very much have this, you know, Protestant ethic that is part of our um, colonial belief that people who became wealthy and successful were those who were chosen by God. And, and so if you're poor, it's because you're a bad person, right? And so we blame poor people for their situation. We don't see them as worthy of government programs to give them a safety net or to help them get a job. We see them as um, fail as as delinquent as as um, you know bad people in some way. And so um, throughout U.S. history, we have continued to do that and really been resistant to the idea of programs that redistribute wealth or uh, broaden the social safety net because we see those as on the one hand um, rewarding laziness or rewarding people who don't deserve it while at the other hand taking away things that those who have earned it have legitimately earned through capitalism right um, and we very strongly believe in capitalism at the same time that we believe in democracy and so there's real resistance to broadening that, uh, both by the people who are wealthy, but even by people who aren't. Mm. James, I'll let you yeah, ask have, us another. Yeah. The next question is sort of, uh, I think applies, it would be interesting in both time periods, which is, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about politi uh, politicians' use of the sort of idea of return to a greater time? Uh, so for Augustus, or for an Augustan time, the sort of um, res publica restituta, and uh, obviously there's some nostalgia that goes on in current politics about uh, about earlier times. How how is this used? Is it used the same way uh, all the time, or is it um, or is it a trope that's used in different ways? Yeah, that's. I mean, we're seeing that on both sides of the aisle right now, right? I mean. Trump's message is make America great again, again, which is harkening back either to pre-pandemic or pre-whatever the again was that um, he likes to talk about. And Biden is talking about getting back to when we weren't so polarized and getting back to when Democrats and Republicans could talk to each other um, without it becoming you know, unpleasant. So they're both trying to harken back to pasts where we all got along and everything was, was great. Um, and I think that's a sign of just how unsettled people are by where we are politically right now, that things do seem really bad and, and we're so polarized and, and there's so many challenges that we're facing um, that people are having nostalgia, whether they're Democrats or Republicans for a time when things were better. And that's problematic in lots of ways for certain communities, right? Uh, certainly uh, for women, for people of color, 
going backwards in time, generally not so great for us. But the idea that we could somehow get out of what we're in now and its unpleasantness is something that both campaigns are selling. And um, that's, that's not new either. Yeah, it's a, and I tend, my mind tends to go to, um, to questions of migration and change when I think about this phenomenon in, in, the, in the Roman Republic, which is of course is, you know, the Roman Empire and it, it was an imperial republic. It's certainly a trope going back into the second century of um, nostalgia for when Rome was Rome and not Greek and not, not too Italian, you know, Southern Italian, not too, there weren't all these people from, from these territories that, you know, we've conquered and, and, and enslaved, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands, certainly at any given time you know, that, so there's a, so one could unpack the psychology of that, um, the acknowledgement of the devastation that Roman imperial expansion created. Um, but, but the the uh, the 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 words I mean the trope over time is uh, is of a of a of a hom of homogeneity you know how much easier it was when we were all we looked the same we spoke the same language and and I and of course you know, it's it's easy to see um, sad to say um, plenty of, of 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 continuing threads of that and it's it it's it, it, it's certainly a matter of what kinds of politicians choose to pump that up or, you know, or to, to talk about, um, to use a different, you know, to, to, to uh, talk about it as a, as a rich tapestry or something that benefits the whole state or, I mean, there are multiple ways to deal with, with change, the kind of change that migration and, and cultural and intercultural uh, diversity creates. But, um, but that's the context that comes to mind when I think about the return to the old in, in, in Roman culture, in Roman political ideology. Can I ask about um, uh, anxieties about the powerlessness of voting and how that, um, whether that discourages people today from voting and feel and issues that are bigger than, uh, than can be dealt, feel like they can be dealt with by, by an election and whether that turns, how that turns people off, some people off from voting. Are there, are there examples from the, uh, the same sort of sense of powerlessness from the painful, complex, messy, and pivotal moments in Roman history. That's you know it it it's it's so difficult to talk about popular issue you know popular discourse popular psychology we we have so little of it. There's a very poignant um, electioneering slogan that's making the rounds on social media these days from Pompeii. It's a quite beautiful red um, graffiti uh, a piece of graffiti. Uh, that that talks about how you know vote for X you know he's an upstanding decent moral man um, you know so even then there's a kind of poignant almost pathos to that um, come on you know put put the good guy in but um, to what degree uh, to what degree that kind of evidence can shed light um, into popular psychology I I think this is a better question for Melissa because our evidence is just so terrible. <laughs> For, for that. But it, but there, I mean, I'll just remind us of the initial scene I evoked, which is if you were poor and you showed up to vote for one of these three offices, the chances of your vote even being recognized or counted was very low and you would have presumably known that. There's a lot of debate about whether people bothered to show up, whether it was a holiday and, and people treated it as a party um, and whether they cared or not. Um, it's, it's, we just don't know. Okay, that just made me think of a whole bunch of other things because it turns out if you do make voting a party these days, folks are more likely to show up um, if you have what's called a, a precinct party, a party at the polls or uh, what some groups I'm working with this season are doing are called party at the mailbox where we're trying to make it celebratory. We're trying to make it a party and there's online you know, DJ parties and, and uh, festivity. Um, so there is a festive nature to it um, but honestly, most people don't vote think their vote is going to make the difference, right? And that would be illogical, right? Most of the time we're voting uh, because uh, we're expressing membership in an identity group. And we're voting as a way to signal our identity in that group, whether it's a member of a political party, a member of a racial group, whatever it is, you're voting to signal that 
you're voting as a way of being there for your community and cementing your membership in that community. And most and and to then get the little I voted sticker that you walk around with and then you get the the warm fuzzies, right? The the civic pride that you get from having fulfilled your duty. So so part of it is signaling identity. Part of it is what we political scientists would call minimax regret, which is extremely strong this year, which is you want to minimize any regret you might have the next day. So if you didn't vote in 2016 and you woke up the next day and you regretted that outcome, you might decide this year you're going to vote in the presidential election to minimize any regret that you might feel the next day or whenever the results are, are released because it might not be the next day because at least you voted, right? You did what you could. And then there's also the socialization that everyone has received since childhood or since taking the citizenship exam that voting is a thing that Americans do, uh, which is why people lie, right? If you ask people if they voted, 95, 98% of people say, oh yes, I voted. And then you can go look them up and you're like, mm, no, I totally didn't vote, right? But they know it's the right answer. And so, um, you vote because you know you're supposed to. And we reinforce that with things like the I voted stickers. And of course, all of the talk about voting that's going on on social media and pretty much everywhere you look these days, that's all reinforcing that socialization. Oh yes, that is my duty as an American, I must go vote. Um, so you vote for duty, you vote for minimax regret, you vote to signal your identity, you don't vote because you really think one vote's going to change it. I mean, unless you are really lucky, uh, you know, there's always an example here or there where the margin of victory was super small, but you know, most elections are not very close, not, not that close that one vote matters. This question is about uh, constancy. Um, uh, which uh, the, the questioner describes as an inherently flexible principle from a Ciceronian viewpoint. Was it prized in the late Republic? Is it prized today? Ooh, that's a, I, I'm thinking what you said, Melissa, about people not being held to their campaign promises. That's, um, it's certainly, I mean, I've, I've written and thought a lot about Cicero himself and, and, um, and he's famously a fence sitter. And it's one of uh, Victorian English scholars hated him because he was, you know, a kind of unmanly waiter to see where things were going to fall. Um, uh, and, and their favorite piece of evidence to cite was that when the assassins of Julius Caesar got their act together and, and decided to, to, to do the deed, um, they didn't seem to have included him. I mean, they did not include him in the plan, um, maybe because they didn't trust him, maybe because they thought he would try to argue again, you know, we, we don't know. Um, but we, we do have a letter uh, from him in which he makes it clear he was not included. So, um, so that said, you know, he, he was, he was an adept politician and wrote some of the most thought-provoking texts we have from the Roman Republic about political virtues. And, and I would turn that to say, you know, he believed very much in, uh, in the capacity of a politician, and he did really believe this was a virtuous capacity, a virtue in itself, of, um, of communicating. Now, we could qu definitely quibble about the content of looking at his own speeches about the content of what he was communicating. But, but he really believed in the power of dial of, I shouldn't say dialogue, of language itself to connect people, um, to sidestep, to avoid violence. Um, and that was something he lived with, grew up with. I mean, it, it was very real to him, I think. So, so, so it's a challenge for someone like a Cicero to say, uh, uh, and as he does um, implicitly through a lot of his work that that a, that one of the core necessities and virtues of acting as a citizen in a republic is to be a good communicator, um, to listen, to speak well, to be able to articulate your ideas well, and then to be constant. Because of course, if you really listen and you really heed and you really engage with other people, you're going to change as a result. So, so I, I think I did a a reasonably good job of channeling Cicero in the answer to that question. <laughs> I think that's also true in modern times. Uh, sometimes politicians do change their minds and 
a famous example that occurs to me is in 2012 when after Biden came out in favor of same-sex marriage, President Obama felt like he needed to also say that his opinion had quote unquote evolved and that he now understood that that was the right thing to do. And, you know, there was kind of a freak out at the time, black Americans in particular tended to be against same-sex marriage at the time. And so there was a lot of, you know, commentary about, oh, will black Americans turn away from their president because he's now, you know, flipped on this issue that they feel very strongly about because of their religious beliefs. And instead, Black Americans followed the president and shifted their views. And now the majority of Black Americans also support same-sex marriage. But it was seen as a big deal because here was this very visible issue on which he had a position, and then he changed it. Um, but he framed it as, well, I've been listening and I've been thinking about it and I'm changing my opinion. Um, so, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush got punished for what we see as lying about whether or not he would raise taxes. Um, so it, it does depend on, I think, how the politician frames it as, well, you know, I, I was lying to you before versus, well, I've been listening. And so I'm changing my mind, right? We're getting a lot of that, I would say, from Biden, that he has really uh, shifted a lot of his policy positions to the left as he has listened to Democrats and he's had conversations with people like Bernie Sanders and his supporters. And so some politicians are able to do that and to frame it as listening. And some politicians, when they are seen as flip-floppers, they are, they are seen as inconstant and they are then seen as not trustworthy. And really what the public wants is someone they can trust. So whether you changed your mind on something or not, right? what is that really telling us about your character? Are you in fact a good person? Because that is important to them more than maybe, you know, individual issue positions on which, you know, like how many people are basing their vote on that, to be honest, but they are basing their vote on, do I trust this person? Do I think this person deserves my vote? That's way more important. Was the role of Roman territories without voting rights similar to that of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, and other territories now? Did those Roman citizens, if domiciled in another city state, gain voting rights? Oh, wow. What a question. The, um, I mean, the comparison question is really interesting, and I, and I want to think more about it. The, uh, as I said, for, for this electoral politics voting for candidates, you did have to show up in the city. There was no way to cast a vote. If, um, uh, and we don't know. It's another mysterious question about kind of mass politics, whether, for example, the Roman citizens who were fighting the constant war. I mean, Rome was essentially always at war um, for hundreds of years, and very few years where they weren't actively prosecuting war somewhere in the empire um, as, it, as it gradually grew larger. So we don't know what what was what the attitude was of soldiers who felt that they would want to cast a ballot out in Germany or Spain, uh, maybe, maybe not not in favor of uh, of current policy. They, they they couldn't though. There was no opportunity to do that. So the so uh, so the situation is 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 really quite radically different in terms of electoral politics. Uh, certainly the. I'll say one more thing, and there's a patchwork of voting rights that evolved over time and very, very complicated. The if you if you look at it visually, the map of Italy itself um, is is like a jigsaw puzzle of the different kinds of municipal and voting rights uh, men had, uh, free men, uh, depending on where they lived, and and what relationship their town or village or city had to Rome itself. Um, but um, but in, in, in this is the one of the, the last thing I'll say. Is this is the way in which Rome strikes me as the most it, it's most primitive in aspect that that the physical place of the city of Rome, the Urbs, is is it is a sacred place. It's it has religious uh, significance, and uh, and it's kind of numinal f um, uh, meaning uh, for uh, for all these political processes is just a it, it really is a different universe from the one we live in now. So it's a great there question. Is a parallel, I want to think about. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. There is no, a go ahead. With Puerto Rico, right? Because if you live in Puerto Rico, you don't get to vote for president. But all you have to do is come to the mainland, and, and you're already a citizen, and you can vote. 
So it's, you know, it's not true for Guamanians or for people who live in other um, territories that the United States has control over, but Puerto Ricans since 1917 have had the ability to vote for president as long as they move their body physically to the mainland United States, which sounds very much like the Roman situation where you, you can't mail it in from Puerto Rico, but if you show up, you get to vote. Um, I think we, well, every once in a while we hear talk about, you know, should we let Puerto Rico become a state? It's unclear whether they even want to become a state, um, but they are all citizens. So they have that very unusual situation going on. Can we talk about popular power? Uh, how do citizens, how did and how do citizens make their interests felt? Yeah, that there's, well, Melissa, do you want to take this one away? <laughs> well, we, we love to make our news felt. I mean, one of the changes that we've all lived through now that we have an internet is, you know, it's not just that the New York Times publishes a paper, it's that there's now comments sections underneath, right? It's, it's news gets posted on, on Twitter and then everybody retweets or replies or comments. And so um, the public actually has far more ways to communicate its preferences these days. And of course we have the modern invention of, of polls where we can measure what the public wants. Um, so there's lots of ways for people to have their, their voices heard. I think, um, you know, you can see that it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, there's definitely plenty of people who try not to read the comments section and prefer to get their news just directly from the professional journalists. But um, are policymakers listening to those? No, <laughs> right? Because polls don't vote, because comment sections don't vote. Um, if anything, it's loud subpublics that have their voices known. It's uh, interest groups. It's people who call their representatives' offices directly. Right. I mean, if you talk to members of Congress or other officials, they'll tell you the you know talk is cheap in a poll. But if somebody's gone through the effort to write a letter to us or to call us on the phone, that person really cares about the issue, right? So there's like the cheap talk of a poll. Maybe you don't even care about that issue, even if you've given an answer. But if you care about it enough that you wrote a letter or you show up to a town hall meeting now the politician is gonna pay attention. And so um, in some ways, our ability to communicate our views has exploded, um, but at the same time, there's still very narrow ways in which elected officials tend to be responsive to those because it's also about salience. It's not just about what the public wants. And, the, and I'll just add that the overriding power of money, of wealth um, in the Roman context is is worth thinking about here and, and thinking about how um, it seems as, so speaking as a non-expert about American politics, just as a, as a regular citizen, the, the failure of both political parties to regulate the flow and influence of money um, in, in the political process, um, the citizen's decision, the, I mean, we, we, we there, it, it's, it's not that there aren't citizens trying to change, uh, to change the situation and improve it, but, um, but we have a long way to go there, and I and and this is a concern that goes that that it's actually very visible in Roman texts. Interestingly, because um, bribery was was a we don't, we don't know exactly how it worked, but it was it was and it, and it was officially against the law, but it was also widely practiced in electoral politics from everything we can see. Um, but um, but some of our our some of the most enduring Roman texts about politics, um, uh, thinking of the historian Sallust, uh, for example, they're all about, they're 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 really all about corruption and the corrupting power of money. Um, I guess it's maybe worth saying because it comes back to some of the issues of identity that you were talking about, Melissa. That um, that one of the things that Sallust, this Roman historian writing, who's a contemporary of Caesar. That he that I think he makes a very interesting connection between the power of money just to get stuff done that rich people want that doesn't benefit anyone else, and that's a clear problem. 
but then the power of money to erase and, and make unrecognizable, just to take recognition away from those who don't have money as though they don't exist at all. And that it's a very interesting theme in a couple of his, 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 um, his histories and, um, and one that you know, I find myself thinking about a lot as, especially as we're all isolated in our Zoom worlds. And the, and the power of big money continues to be a huge influence on campaigns, right? I mean, this this year, the spending is uh, breaking all records, uh, the, uh, especially the amount of super PAC spending. Um, so the amount of money in politics is huge. And while we have mostly political equality, where each person's vote counts equally, if you have more money, you do have more political influence and you are able to influence who has a successful campaign through your donations. Um, if not through a hard money donation to your preferred candidate, then through an interest group or dark money that, that nobody can trace. And you can spend as many billions as you want um, to support your preferred candidate. And so if you are wealthy, you know, um, <laughs> you have more political power so it's, um, it's more and more a topic of conversation, I think, uh, when, when the purse strings were exploded, thanks to Citizens United and some other Supreme Court decisions, I don't think everyone quite realized what that would mean. Um, but now, especially this year, we're really seeing it. And, you know, thankfully, I don't live in a swing state. But my understanding is that if you live in a, in a swing state, especially, you know, Florida, you're just getting constantly bombarded and it's evidence of how much money is being spent. And I think that sends a signal to people that they're just one little vote. And I think it's also disempowering. So not only does it create the appearance of corruption, um, but I think it can demobilize people or make people feel alienated that these people with so much money are the ones that seem to be making all the, you know, that really have power here. So it's something that I think we're going to have to confront. Hard to confront that uh, without a Supreme Court decision that goes the other way. But you know, Supreme Court decisions aren't forever, usually. I think it's it's probably six forty-five. So we should probably let people go. But there are many more good questions. I feel like I have so many more things I would say. We could just do that for hours. Um, Same. <laughs> Thank you for trying out this experiment and compare and contrast. <laughs> it was really fun. Thank you all for coming and thank you for having me. Same, thank you. This really was a, a wonderful discussion. Can I thank you both, Joy and Melissa, for taking the time. Uh, we were at it for almost two hours and it, it, we could have gone on uh, much, much longer, but I think people probably need to eat. Um, in, in fact, uh, if we were meeting in person, as we have done in the past and will do again in the future, we would have moved from the auditorium to the room next door uh, to have, and we do pretty good, pretty good receptions <laughs> at the Center for Ancient Studies. We would have had a very nice uh, food and uh, drink reception where we would be able to continue the conversation in smaller groups. We can't do that now, but I, I, I hope that for all of us that we would take the opportunity uh, wherever we may may be, to talk uh, and continue the conversation informally with our with our our families, if we're faculty, with with our students, with our friends, and and, and with the larger community and the groups of which we are part. And of course, if any lesson comes across, we, that in two weeks we will also, whatever our thoughts are and preferences, express the the the, the right that we have to vote. So again, I I, I want to thank both of you so much for. Uh, a really informative conversation, but also very thought provocative and, and, and very almost inspiring. Uh, uh, very, very helpful and a great way to start off our uh, webinar series for the year. I, I also want to thank my colleague, uh, Maura Pollard, who's our center's wonderful program administrator, uh, because she was responsible for all aspects of today's program, but she has in fact worked tirelessly on all of the events that we will be having in our series this year. And, and I also want to take the opportunity of thanking Hui Yan Kim and the President's Office of the ACLS and also the Vice President of the ACLS, uh, James Shulman, who managed the conversation and passing the questions on to our speakers so that they would 
be able to address the concerns that a number of us uh, had on, on this webinar. But finally, I also wanna thank everybody who attended and participated uh, this evening. I, I hope that you found it as stimulating as I did. And I also hope that we will uh, have you join us uh, in just a bit more than a week for our next event on Thursday the 29th, which is about monuments and memory and which we'll get into additional timely conversation. As you say, Joy, compare and contrast our world with the world of antiquity and see what we can learn thereby. But again, both of you, thank you and thank everybody for a terrific evening.